Hey guys, this is Dodoid. So as you can see, my face is a little messed up right now, but uh, we're still going to talk about SGIs. So uh, in this episode, part four of the series, we'll be going over 1996 and 1997. Now those years covered a complete product refresh of everything in SGI's product lineup, so we can, I can already tell it's going to be a long episode. Let's get right into that. After last episode's period of no major product launches, the late 90s were certain to be a time of major advancements for SGI. With improved components for existing systems being their only hardware launches for almost three years straight, it would have to be. Starting at the low end, SGI had begun 1996 with a new R5000-based Indy. While it was quite a good system and did not suffer from any technical issues, it is quite rare today. This is because the R5000 Indy was seemingly a strange stopgap product, meant to bring the R5000 to SGI customers 10 months before their new hardware did. This is a similar story to that of the SGI Crimson, which existed for only a year before being replaced with the Onyx. Unlike the R10,000 systems also introduced in 1996, which seemingly coexisted existed with their successors as cheaper options until 1999, the R5000 Indy was discontinued just months after it was replaced. Its replacement came in the form of the SGI-02, a unified memory architecture workstation released at the end of 1996 for a price of six dollars to $15,000. Interestingly, unlike every other MIPS SGI, its graphics chipset, known as CRM, is built into the motherboard as opposed to on a separate card or board. CRM is quite interesting, so I'll explain a little about it. Like on some models of Indy, geometry calculations are performed on the CPU, meaning that upgrading the O2 CPU can improve graphics performance more than it might on other systems. Though basic geometry is done by the CPU, Z-buffering and texturing are done by a separate chip known as the Memory and Rendering Engine. The O2 also includes compression hardware known as the Imaging and Compression Engine, based on a separate R4000 based CPU and a custom vector processor. With video options available at launch, compression in hardware, and the ability to use up to a MIPS R10000, the O2 was aimed squarely at the professional video, motion graphics, and medical imaging markets. Of course, being an SGI product, it was also great for 3D graphics work if you didn't need all the power of an Indigo 2 impact and wanted something a little cheaper. The O2 was a recipe for success, and successful it was. If you want to see a whole video about my O2, click the link here or the one at the end of the video. The Indy wasn't the only product being replaced in 1996, however. SGI's Challenge and Onyx lines also got an upgrade in the form of the Origin and Onyx 2 lines. Like the Challenge and Onyx before it, the Origin 2000 was available in desk side and rack form factors, though multiple chassis could be linked together to create one larger system. In effect, and with some limitations, if you wanted your giant computer to be twice as powerful, you could just hook it up to another one. This interconnect, known as Craylink, or later Numalink, was the result of SGI's acquisition of Cray, and is actually still used in some form in the SGI systems of today. If you wanted graphics capability, you could get the same system with one or more additional Infinite Reality 2 graphics systems. This variant was known as the Onyx 2. Regardless of brand name, internally the systems all used a new architecture which SGI called S2MP. SGI wasn't done replacing Challenges, though, because the Indigo 2-based Challenge M also needed an upgrade. This came in the form of the Origin 200, an S2MP-based server with a simple Craylink implementation and a MIPS R10000 processor. While I can't say for sure, the Origin 200 seems to be one of the less talked about SGI systems today. This is backed up by some Nekochan forum search results. While the system performed well, and was, from what I can tell, well-reviewed, its very SGI-like $30,000 to $60,000 price, and the ever-growing threat of Linux may have hurt widespread use of the systems for basic server tasks. Though the Challenge Onyx and Indy had all been replaced by late 1996, SGI's highest-end workstation system was still the Indigo 2 Impact 10,000. Its replacement came in the form of the SGI Octane, released in early 1997. From a graphics standpoint, the system used a somewhat improved version of the Indigo 2's Impact chipset. The Octane also used the same R10,000 processor that other SGIs had had for almost a year by that point. In fact, at first glance, you may wonder why the Octane was one of SGI's most successful systems of all time. The answer lies with the Octane's system architecture. While not identical to the Origins S2MP, it is closely related and shares many technologies such as XIO and the crossbar interconnect. This not only allows for incredibly high bandwidth communications within the system, but also allows the system's architecture to support multiple processors. 
SGI took full advantage, shipping the Octane with optional dual CPUs instead of just one chip like every other desktop all the way back to the personal iris. These two capabilities turned the Octane from an Indigo 2 Impact 10,000 in a faded Indigo case into a seriously capable graphics and video workstation, which some insist today was SGI's last truly great product. Perhaps the most memorable thing about the Octane, however, is how they marketed it. SGI was known for their strange merchandise, such as the inflatable O2, Espresso Go Coffee Maker, and Wind Up Walking Origin 200, but I suspect most would say the Octane beats them all. Best known as the Octane Soundtrack, a five-song album SGI released to promote the Octane. I have a dream, and it's called a crossbar switch. What this will mean is no big data glitch. Have no fear, get data in and out of here Just with the flip of a switch I have a dream and it's called a crossbar switch Octane, we're gonna rock Octane This thing called Octane, it swings with performance It's a bit strange Less known, however, are Octane Ale and Beer, Octane Keychains, the Roctane CD player, and even an unconfirmed account of Octane lighters, which were supposedly destroyed after challenge power supplies were revealed to have electrical safety issues. If you want to see a video about my main Octane, which is also currently my main SGI, and the one I gave OS First Timer access to, click here, or, as said earlier, wait for all of the links to appear at the end of the video. So that was part four of our History of Silicon Graphics series. If you did enjoy the video, then please do subscribe, as it does help us grow. Links will be up right now, and thanks for watching. Bye!